Welcome, everyone. My name is Dylan Atlas Baker. I'm uh, your host for today. I'm one of the co-founders here at Spectacles, and so really uh, pleased that you're all been able to join us for the first of uh, what will be many kind of looker-focused webinars that we're kicking off today. Um, so today's about how to fix your LookML project structure. Uh, Josh, who's on the call, is going to be talking you all through that in just a second. Uh, but before he does, I really just want to talk about kind of what we're doing here, what the purpose of this is, and kind of what you can expect in the future. So uh, we're not going to talk all that much about Spectacles today. That's not really the purpose of, of these webinars. Uh, but Spectacles is a continuous integration tool for Looker. And so we are very focused on Looker as a tool and really wanted to find a way to bring the Looker community together, um, to provide really high quality content to the Looker community and find a way for us all to kind of upskill as we go on our journey of being kind of Looker developers, Looker admins. And so the goal for these webinars is to do them every other week. They'll be this slot, typically kind of 5 p.m. UK time on a Wednesday. It's typically midday in the East Coast, uh, 9 a.m. on the West Coast, um, and do them every every two weeks. We'll take a short break for Christmas, but other than that, uh, we've got these scheduled already all the way through February. And so the topics of these webinars are going to be kind of a variety of looker-focused things, typically pretty hands-on and, and of a, you know, not crazy technical, but of a technical nature about kind of the implementation, very practical hands-on topics. And so today's is about how to fix your LookML project structure, but we've got multi-instance Looker deployments, how to link your LookML, how to use the Looker API, um, optimizing cost and speed. And so things like that um, are the topics that we've gotten. So I know that many of you have already joined us for, uh, have already signed up rather for the future webinars. Big thank you for that. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll get most of you there for, for the ones in the future. Um, the other thing to flag here is if there's something that you're doing in Looker that's really interesting, cool, you think worth, you know, having people hear about, you think is would be educational to the Looker community, please get in touch. We'd love to have you join us up here. Um, today, it's Josh and I, we're both from Spectacles, but many of these scheduled webinars are with our partners or with consulting firms or with customers or with prospects, you know, people who are just doing cool things in Looker, have lots of deep experience with Looker, um, and the goal is just to showcase that. So. If you're interested in doing one of these in the future, uh, please just get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. And you can sign up for all the future ones at the URL at the bottom here, spectacles.dev uh, slash webinars. Cool. So one last thing before I hand over to Josh is basically who we are. Um, so Josh and I have been really lucky. We've been Looker users almost since the beginning. I was a user since about 2014. I think Josh shortly thereafter. Um, and we've seen Looker deployments both through our own professional work as uh, in-house. I was a consultant for a long time and then through Spectacles at a whole range of um, different companies, different sizes, experience different things. And so um, part, of, part of the reason we started Spectacles as a company, and it's part of the reason we feel you know, reasonably qualified to get up here and talk to you all today about um, what we're gonna talk to you about. So that's a little bit about who we are. And, and this is really just here to give you a sense that you can kind of probably trust what we're saying, or, or hopefully at least start from a, start from a basis of trust and, and go from there. Um, so in just a second, I'm going to hand over to Josh. Uh, before I do, as many of you did, just to tell us where you're coming from today, um, there's going to be a QA and a at the end of this. And please, if a question comes up while Josh is talking, just drop it in there. Um, I will kind of be reading them out to him towards the end of this session. And we're going to, we may not get to all the questions, but we'll try to get to, to most of them and certainly the most pertinent for this group um, and go from there. And so the format of these is typically going to be about 30 minutes roughly split between 20 minutes of like presentation, 10 minutes of Q&A. We'll see how we uh, how we stick to that. We've got kind of the put up as 45, just in case we overrun a little. So that's the end of me. I'm going to hand over to Josh, whose uh, very capable hands you're all going to be in. Thank you very much, everyone. Cool. Thanks, Dylan. And hello, everyone. It's so cool to see all the names trickling in in the attendee list. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your day today. Uh, I. I noticed that Looker turned 10 years old this year. So depending on which news article you read, Looker was founded uh, in 2011 or 2012. So I mean, safe to say Looker is a mature BI tool. And what we're seeing as we work with customers is that we're seeing a lot more customers who've been using Looker for three, four, five plus years. And because Looker makes it really easy, maybe a little too easy to add LookML, we're seeing that the longer that people have Looker, the more out of control their projects can get. I mean, we're talking like we work with companies who have um, hundreds, if not thousands of explorers and all of 
those explorers are sitting on top of even more view files, which sit on top of this ever shifting layer of database tables. And they're constantly in flux, right? So it's this recipe for disaster where you have people working in LookML, wasting tons of their time, just trying to navigate these long files, find the right place to update a dimension because something changed in the schema. And then they're also wasting time just understanding like, okay, this explore, where does it come from? Where, where are the different views? And oh, it's imported from this project. And then it's in this view file and this view file has you know a thousand lines. So um, we're just seeing a lot of inefficiencies in the way that Looker projects are structured. And so I'm gonna share with you today a new and improved project structure that uses the latest and greatest Looker features to solve a lot of these problems. And I'm really gonna try and break it down very practically so you can understand it and apply it at your own company. Um, this isn't gonna be a high level kind of think piece webinar. We really wanna get down at the nitty gritty, walk through an example project, think about how you might be able to um, take away right away after this webinar, uh, some of this information and, and apply it to your own Looker instance. So everything will work as long as you pay attention. So webinars are really great because I can speak to all of you in your homes and your offices all across the world, but they're challenging because distractions are just a click away, right? There's always a, another tab, another message, a, a Slack, some other work that you were doing right before this. So I'm just going to encourage you over the next 20 minutes, not a long time, to just really pay attention and focus on what we're talking about today. Treat it as a training, as an investment in yourself and in your, in your team. And I promise you that by the end of these next 20 minutes, you'll have something useful that you can go back and apply. Um, so do what you need to do, put that Slack on, do not disturb, you know, flip the phone over, whatever it takes, but let's, let's dive in and get started. All right. Cool, so we're gonna hit on three points today and then we're gonna talk application at the end. So this project structure really has three pillars. The first pillar is getting around these sort of pesky schema changes and how long they take to update LookML by using auto-generated LookML. The second is to uh, sort of, in order to enable that, move all of our hand edits to LookML files into a new layer that uses refinements. Refinements are a great Looker feature that not everyone's aware of. And the third one is to organize your explorers and anything that's specific to those explorers into their own dedicated files. So we're going to hit these three pillars. We're going to talk about how to actually do this safely in your project without making people angry, without uh, you know having to shut everything down for three months while you do this giant refactor. And I want to just say that this idea is not mine. It's not Dylan's either. We are just sort of amplifying and getting the word out about something that we think can be really powerful. Um, this, this layered project structure was first posted about in the Looker community forums by Fabio Beltramini, who's a longtime uh, Looker employee and has put out tons of amazing stuff. He created the Lambs Linter. He's, he's done so much for um, Looker developers. And Kenny Ning, who is a, a partner of ours, was using this structure a lot at his uh, client engagements and felt like people weren't aware of how great it was. So we partnered with him to write a blog post, which will cover all the content I'm going through today. You can read it afterwards, uh, basically just talking about like uh, this structure and why it's so great. So props to both of these guys for their, their work paving the way on this. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a sample project. It's kind of a toy example. But it's a simple project. It's got a model file and it's got three views. There's two views that are sitting directly on top of the data warehouse table and a third view, which is a SQL derived table. This is a pretty common structure in, in a lot of Looker projects. And uh, our goal is to apply our new structure to this project and make it work better. The first thing that we can do is to auto generate our LookML. And so Looker already has a built-in way to auto-generate LookML from table schemas. It's called create view from table. And when you go to create a new view, you maybe used this before um, when you're creating a new view from scratch. It works generally pretty well. It can even sometimes import like column descriptions from your data warehouse if you have those defined there. And you click that button, you get a new view with a default count measure and all the dimensions defined. And it works really great for creating a view file. But if anything changes in that view file, uh, or sorry, if anything changes in the, the data warehouse table, you run into problems. Why do you run into problems? You run into problems because 
it's quite possible that since then you've added a lot of your own edits to that auto-generated auto file. You've probably, you know, added some second order dimensions. You've added measures. Maybe you've marked a dimension as a primary key, labels, descriptions, right? You're doing the normal work in LookML right on top of that same file. So if you were to hit create view from table again, you would lose all of that work because it just overwrites the file. So what we want is a way where we can actually run create view from table whenever the table changes without overriding all of our, our hard work. And this is really where refinements make this possible. Refinements is this great feature in Looker that I'm going to talk about in the next section. But for now, just know that what we're going to end up with is a layer. And what I mean by layer is just a number of view files that sit in a folder somewhere that are all auto-generated and that we never touch by hand. Those view files only ever get changed by rerunning create view from table. So we have a purely auto-generated base layer of LookML that sits on top of the data warehouse. And if you've used dbt before, you're probably familiar with this concept. It's also like something that's often used in dbt projects to have this thin layer that sits on top of your data warehouse tables. So if we imagine like a traditional view file where we've got everything in there, you can see it's, you know, like let's imagine it's super long and uh, the white in white are things that would have just been auto generated, but in purple are things that I've maybe changed by hand. Like I've this this column in the table is called T constant, and I've changed it to title ID and the dimension name. And like I've marked that it's a primary key. I've added a measure. It's a sum measure. All of that, you know, normally would go away if I regenerated the file. So what we have after is sort of this base, the base layer view file that strips out all the fun stuff that I've hand edited. It just has the basics. You know, this is LookML that represents the table itself. And this is what our folder structure looks like. We've sort of grouped all of these into um, subfolders that match the name of the schema in the data warehouse, and then an overall folder underscore base where all of our, our base layer lives. The underscore is really like a personal preference. It just brings it up to the top of the file tree when it sorts alphabetically. You know, you don't have to follow this exact structure, but this is just a suggestion. Okay, so let's talk about how refinements make all of this possible. So if you haven't used the refinements before, they're a great feature in Looker. They're relatively new. Um, and they allow you to basically take an existing view or an explore and adapt it. So change certain things within it without editing the original LookML file or having to create like an entirely fresh copy of it. If you've ever seen a plus sign in front of a view name, that's a refined view. So there's, there's refinements and there's extensions. They're slightly different. They do very much the same thing. Um, and ex the, the, the fundamental difference under the hood is that an extension actually creates a copy of a view or explore. Whereas a refinement allows you to modify that view or explore in place. Generally, you want to use refinements. That's kind of the best, like, I'm not sure what to use. What should I use? Use refinements. There are some cases where extensions are, um, are, are actually the right, the right tool. So if we think about how we might take our view file from before and use refinements here, we now have a new, a new file. Um, in our, our what we call our standard layer, but our refine layer, we're including the view that holds the auto-generated base layer code. You can see that at the top. And we put the plus sign to indicate that this is a refinement. And so the way that refinements will work now is unless we define it in the refined view, or, or a better way to say it is if we don't define it in the refined view, Looker will pull through the version that's in the base view. Meaning, if we don't touch it, we get the auto-generated LookML. And that's exactly what we want because we want the ability to change that. Furthermore, we can choose just only specific parameters within a dimension or a measure that we want to change. So like here you can see we've taken this T constant column um, and we've you know marked it as a primary key. Um, we, you, this is also where you would add all of your measures and where you would add your labels, where you would add column descriptions. And so you can think of refinements as a way of just sort of tweaking in place uh, a particular view. So if we look at our folder structure after we've added this new, what we're calling standard layer, you can see that we have now a folder called standard with the ratings um, file in here that refines that ratings view. And we can then, the, the last step that we can take 
um, is to try to get away from these giant model files that just stretch on and on and on and contain hundreds and hundreds of explorers. So uh, you may not know this, but explorers in Looker can actually go in their own files. They, uh, as long as they're included in the model file, they can go in their, you know, their own unique files. And so what we recommend is actually you, you split up your explorers into their own files. Um, this allows you to use all the benefits of the file tree to, you know, organize by subfolders and to be able to navigate through the existing files in your project. Um, and you can even, aside from the explorers themselves going in these files, you can even put in things that are specific, like refinements that are specific to that explorer. So if you need to modify a dimension um, or add a dimension to a view just for the purpose of that explorer, you can just put that in a refinement that lives inside of that uh, inside of that explore file and the explorer can use it and you get to benefit from the readability of seeing all of the intermediate changes that need to be made to power that explore. And then the benefit of this is your model files get really simple. Your model files just end up being a long list of include statements pulling these explore files in and they really only have to contain config. So your connections, your access grants, your data groups, all of that can live in there. Um, but they, they're much more manageable to, to look at. So here you can see, like, uh, we've created a, a file called ratings.explore.lookml. Um, pro tip, you can put whatever you want before .lookml. You can put any anything you want there, and Looker will still recognize that as a lookml file. So I think in, in our, our project structure, we use, you know, view.lookml for the base. We use layer.lookml for standard, and we use explore.lookml for these explore files. You can do whatever you want, whatever helps you organize what kind of file you're looking at. Um, and you can see here, we've created a, a PDT. That's a drive table that's just for this Explorer. And we've created a, a you know a review that refines the ratings view a bit. Um, again, just for the sort of the purpose of this Explorer. So this is, this makes it so much easier now when, you know, when you're a new developer and you're getting onboarded or you're a existing developer going after a problem in an area that you're not as familiar with. It's very easy to navigate the project structure because you just need to find the files and everything that you need to understand them lives in there. So tracking flows gets much more straightforward. Uh, yeah, and so then this is what our project structure would look like after adding that last layer. We've got some explore files in there. And then our model gets way simpler. So you can see here, we're just ex including a couple of explorers. We're uh, adding a label, we're adding a connection, and and it's much more much more readable now. Okay, so hopefully you're you find this idea compelling, and you're thinking about well, maybe we could we could try something like this with our Looker instance. How do we do it? And what we would suggest is you actually work backwards. So you start by splitting out explorers into their own files. This will help you sort out permissions issues right away. Um, it will also help you by uh, indicating to you which kind of like which views are specific to um, explorers, like what kind of things you're doing that are just for that explorer and could possibly go into that file with it. Uh, and, and this will also just give you a big readability boost to your project. Um, you know, feel free to tackle it on a smaller project first or only on a specific part of the project or a, a single small model or something like that that's manageable. But start here. And then you can split up your view files. So you can uh, go through that exercise of running create view from table creating the base layer, and then take those existing view, view files, remove anything that's just boilerplate and already exists in the base layer, keep the stuff that is fine tuning and refining and move that into a refinement instead of a view. Uh, and then organize those, those files into a separate folder. Um, and, and then the other thing we'd recommend is that these are big changes. Like this is a pretty far reaching, could be a pretty far reaching refactor of a Looker project and refactors of Looker projects don't come without bumps in the road and bugs. So I highly recommend that you use Spectacles to test these changes um, because Spectacles will check the commits that you make for any kind of SQL errors, for failing data tests, for areas where maybe you've broken the content validator and from a lot of our customers who have gone through big refactors of their Looker project, they basically tell us they couldn't have done it without Spectacles because it gives them the confidence that they need that they can ship these big changes without, you know, 
pulling the rug out from under their users and introducing lots of problems and bugs. Cool. So again, just to touch on these three changes, one is the auto generation of LookML, which makes recover makes reacting to schema changes so easy. Uh, makes it so easy. Just rerun that, hit that button, rerun it, update the table, and see in your you know in your LookML validator any changes that need to be made uh, accordingly. The next is to centralize those edits into a refined layer. Again, much easier just to see, hey, what's different about my view from just looking at this table natively. What has this look LookML analyst done to this view that's different from if I were to just select star on this table? And then putting explorers and, and, and things that go along with them into dedicated files, again, adds a lot to just the scannability and reduces the file size uh, across your project. And then we talked about a few ways that you can actually, how you could actually go about doing this um, in your existing project. Cool. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and, and hand over to Dylan, who will be running the Q&A. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Uh, first thing I'm going to do, actually, is I've just dropped a, a note in the webinar chat, which I think everyone should be able to see, uh, which is a link to Kenny's original blog post. And so if you do want to read any more of this more in depth, um, we'll be sharing this presentation and the uh, webinar itself, the recording live, but you may, you know, not want to wait the day or two to get that and may want to read the blog post right away. And so I'd highly recommend uh, that as the place to start. Um, and so what we're going to do now uh, is answer any questions you have. And so please feel free to, to continue to write them in. I apologize if we don't get to all of them. We will uh, aim to get to as many as possible. Um, and so the first one we're going to answer is one from Mitchell uh, Oslins. Um, and uh, we're going to answer it live. And so the question is, does running create view from table again automatically overwrite the base view if it already exists? Uh, does it depend on your data warehouse? Um, I can quickly answer that one. Uh, you do need to delete the original view. So the, the format is that you'll delete the one that's there and then rerun it. It, it won't let you create one if it already exists. Um, and that's part of the value of this is that uh, it lets you um, quickly kind of tear down what's there and get a fully generated new version um, without having to risk losing kind of anything that you actually wanted to write yourself. Because anything that would have been in that original file would have uh, been written in the kind of refined layer Sorry, anything that's in that file is what was auto-generated. Anything that you put would have been the refined layer um, up above, which is which is great. The nice bit about this is also that it'll tell you as you do that in a LookML validator whether a column that used to be there is now going to disappear because you'll now find LookML references to it downstream that Looker can find in a way that it can't if you're just doing this all um, in a single file from a from a SQL point of view. You could even think about doing this. Um on like a table in a dev schema. If you're thinking about that development workflow, like you could regenerate the view from, you know, a DBT dev schema, see if the changes are going to have impact on the LookML validator. And then, you know, think about how you're going to make those changes all together at once. Um, we've got this question uh, a couple times or something like it a couple times. Uh, Josh, are there any examples where an extend might be preferred over a refinement? Yeah, I'm going to toss this one over to you, Dylan. Yeah. So what one of the main ones is if you need two versions of, you basically need the edited view and the base view in the same explore or something like that. So what's interesting about refinements is, is they're kind of contingent on like the import path of the lookML. And so if I import a view and then I refine it, I and then I refer to it, I don't have access to the original version of, of that view. And if for some reason I need both like the original version and some updated version, I want to combine those both in an explorer or something like that. Um, I'm going to want to have the base and then I'm going to want to extend it. That gives it a new name and it allows me to reference to both of them um, in a way that when you refine, you just have like ratings in, in Josh's example, it's just now updated. Um, and that means that uh, you can't access the original original version of ratings that may have, you know, had a different definition, different field set, anything like that. And so that's one of the, I think that's the main case I see for where an extension is going to be more useful than, um, than a, a refinement. You can also use extensions on other objects like explorers and things like that. Um, and so I think like there, 
there's going to be a ton of use cases where extensions probably make more sense than a, than a refinement. We've got a question from Pedro around the um, folder structure. And so his question, um, I think everyone can see this, but there's basically kind of like in a model folder. And then the question is for the base and standard, Josh, that you defined, do you kind of have business domain and then base and standard underneath, or do you have base and then all of the areas and then standard and all of the areas kind of what's that top level one is, is I think the question from Pedro there. Yeah, I think the great thing about doing this in files is you can pretty much decide how you want to do it. Um, you know, because you're going to be using the include statements in Looker to import these files into the right place. If you want to have it grouped by, you know, like Mart or domain or something like that, you can do that. If you'd rather think about the sort of function of the file first and then and group within that, you can do that as well. Um, we, I don't think we're particularly opinionated about the way that this this goes, but um, Kenny, when we worked with him to write the blog post, recommended the you know top level being base and standard, and then grouping accordingly within there. So grouping within the base layer on uh, database schema, so that it, it maps really nicely to looking at your your data warehouse, and then you know grouping within the standard layer, maybe more around domain or something like that. Yeah, I think just to tackle to Josh's point, I think finding some mapping to to how to either your warehouse or maybe you're using something like dbt and there's like a specific folder structure that you have for these dbt models and you want the corresponding view to be structured in the same way you basically want to do whatever makes it easiest for you to i think find those views the whole point of this not the whole point one of the many points of this structure is that it makes discoverability of files much easier and so i think it's whatever system works for you and i think the two that we've seen the most are yeah, just replicating the database schema in that folder structure or replicating something like a dbt project structure in, in those view files. Either of those make um, make a lot of sense. Um, do you see any problems or downsides combining this with a multi-model project? Josh, I'll give that to you if you want to take a stab. Um, No, I don't. I can't think of any immediate downsides. Um, it's possible that if you have a multi-model project, you may not suffer from some of these problems quite as much. Like these problems tend to manifest themselves more in fewer model projects that have really long model files and a lot of share. Um, so yeah, so you, you may not notice this, these problems to the extent, but I think this would work just as well in a multi-model project. Yeah, I think that's right. I think one of the other things I'd say is I think one of the reasons people go multi-model is less because they're leveraging like the permissions that multi-model lets you have. And it's more to tackle some of the like code maintainability and discoverability issues that we're talking about in this in this kind of structure. And so one of the things I think you can do is actually maybe go to a single model. Like this might empower you to go to a single model structure because the maintainability in the, in, of the code isn't going to be an issue. It's just like that model file is basically just a number of imports. I think one of the reasons, I think whether or not you use multi-model at that point or not becomes a question of, do I need the permissions that come from that multi-model setup? And, and so for people who are less familiar with this, one of the ways you can grant people access to explorers is by granting people access to models via model sets. And so if you, one of the reasons you may want to do models is multi-models is in order to leverage that. But I think one thing we're seeing a lot of is people, instead of using those model structures, using access grants to act, to give people access to explorers. I think that can give you a bit more like fine grain. I think it, it, this is probably a topic for like a whole other webinar and we should probably queue that up. But, um, and, and you can then define those access grants on the explorers in the explorer files. And so the, Josh's short answer was totally correct. It's like, I, there's no downsides. I think you can do this in a multi-model project if you want. Um, but I think you may, what, one of the things this project, this structure allows you to do is actually go to multi bottle or not for reasons other than just like code structure. Um, cool. Um, let me just try to read these, which was an issue. Um, 
So we've got one here that says in Kenny's post and the, in the screenshot shown, there's a PDT defined in the explore file, which is nice if that PDT is only that only in that view. However, if we're using the same PDT across multiple explorers, would it be better practice to not define it in the explorer and instead of its own view file? Um, yes. Yeah. 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 For I, sure. think, I think the idea behind defining things that are not explorers in the explore files is to make it easy for the developer to understand how that explorer is being generated. So certainly if you have things that are being shared across multiple explorers, those are just going in their own views. Um, and, and then it's only things where you're making kind of these very specific tweaks to generate an explorer or you need to, you need to create an intermediate explorer. You need to create a native derived table off of that explorer. And you need to then, you know, bring all of that into the final explorer. Those are things that can live in the explore file just to make it really easy to understand the flow. Yeah. Uh, so I just continue to scroll, scroll through, through these. Um, Da -da 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 -da. Sorry, give me a second. Suppose we have, uh, suppose we hope to have multiple versions of the same base explorer, say a users explorer, where different audiences want different views joined. How would we handle this? Different standalone explorer files that refine a base explorer? That's a great question. I think we've got a couple of questions similarly about kind of like explorers and extending explorers. It's probably a bigger topic again than than what we can give in in a couple of minutes here. There's a couple different ways to to do this. I think. One, you could redefine the explorers, you know, each their own and, and do the views. Um, what's nice about this, though, is you can have one explorer file import another explorer file. So you can kind of do it the path, which I think might be might be what's being uh, described here. I think one of the things to be careful about in that structure, um, and this is, I guess, getting maybe more tactical than we want to, but if you have like, if you're trying to extend an explorer and one explorer file imports another explorer file, and then that file is imported into a model file, that model file will be importing both of those explorers, which is fine if you're doing a single model file because all the explorers end up there anyway. But if you're doing multi-model, you wanna be careful about kind of which explorers via imports are ending up in the right um, in the right model file and, and aren't. And so um, you can use extensions. I think you could conceivably use multiple, you know, define multiple extensions in the same, or extensions of an explorer in the same explorer file. Um, but I think I'd be interested in Kenny's answer. We could maybe go get it after this. I think one of the things I'd probably say is like, depending on how big the explorers are, and I think there's a separate question about how big an explorer should be. And our view is probably that it's like not that many joins. It's like two, three, four, five. Um, that you may be better off redefining like a new version of that explorer each time. Um, that from a discoverability point of view and a maintainability point of view, assuming there aren't too many joins, that may be easier than like getting too far away from the structure we outlined where, you know, explorers are importing explorers. It just starts to get a little messy and and sometimes slightly less dry code is better than code where like it takes you way too long to figure out what's going on. Yeah. The thing I would just add to that, I think some of the questions are touching on this of like, when does something belong in its own file? And I would just say that uh, it generally tends to be this balancing act between keeping things in the same file that were related to each other. So you can understand uh, again, that like kind of logical flow of information throughout the project, but not putting so much into a single file that it becomes impossible to navigate. So, I mean, another just good like gut check is how much time do you feel like you're spending scrolling through these files? And and if it's a lot, then Looker's provide a lot of great tools and ways to split things out. Um, otherwise, there is a, a benefit in just being able to understand how things flow by having them in the same file. Uh, we're going to do one one last question here, um, and it's a it's a really nice one. So this is from Tom Ross, and he says, "If I generate a view from a table and it contains a dimension called foovar, f o o v a r, and so there's a table in the warehouse that has a, a column called foovar that gets turned into a dimension when it's auto generated, and then I create a refinement view based on it, and in that view I have a new dimension that applies some logic to. Oh, I think that was probably a typo. First one should have been foovar, which makes more sense." Uh, and then that applies some logic to foobar. What happens to the table.foobar? What happens when table.foobar changes to foobaz in the data warehouse? I run create from table again. Is there a way to know that the logic and the refinement may need an update if the dimension name changes? Um, so the question is, I've got a, I've got an underlying table that has a column called foobar. I've got an auto-generated base view 
that uh, has that auto generated. And then I refine that in some way, make a reference to the dimension foobar. Um, what's really cool about the setup, and it's actually one of the best bits about the setup, is because you're using LookML to make the reference in the refined view, when you auto-generate the new version of the auto-generated view, and that dimension disappears and becomes foobaz, the LookML validator is actually going to tell you that there's an error. Because the LookML validator is going to tell you, this uh, reference to foobar, I cannot find that dimension anymore. And so a lot of people um, who use the kind of a more traditional structure, use something like spectacles to you know find these errors because that's something that when the LookML validator doesn't catch it, this like SQL, it results in a SQL error because the underlying warehouse is changing without you changing the SQL reference in your views. What's really cool about this, and Tom, I hope I'm answering your question, is when you regenerate that base view, if you've made references to things that have disappeared downstream, the LookML validator will pick those up. And it means that kind of, the implications of a SQL change are now automatically picked up by by Looker as opposed to you know needing to get something like Spectacles, which uh, I guess if you can do without is great. We highly recommend it for for many use cases, and it could probably applies to lots of you. But um, that's one of the cool things about it is like Looker will flag that as part of the change management process. Um, I know we've got a couple more questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get them to them all today, um, but. Really, really appreciate all the great questions. Really appreciate all of you joining us today. Um, as I said earlier, we're, we've got more of these coming up. So these are every two weeks. You can go to spectacles.dev slash webinars to find all of them. Uh, the next one in two weeks is about multi-instance Looker deployments. So that's both if you have multiple instances today, uh, some advice on you know how to use it, but also if you're thinking about it or, or you don't really know about multi-instance deployments, we'll go through like what are the pros and cons? What are the benefits of doing it? Um, and, and what or not. Um, so that's in two weeks. We're running that with the team at Bytecode. So we hope to see lots of you there. Um, and in the meantime, um, if you want to answer these questions and, and some of the ones we didn't get to, or you want to continue this conversation, um, we have a Slack community for Spectacles. Uh, and so if you go to our website, spectacles.dev, right at the bottom, you'll see the Slack logo. Click on that. You can join. Um, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, Josh and I can jump in and answer them as we have today. Um, and then additionally, I'd be remiss. Uh, thank you, Josh, for sharing the Slack link. Uh, I'd be Oh, he shared that with me. Let me share that with everyone. Uh, and then I'd be remiss to say, if you think that uh, automated testing from something like Spectacles might benefit your team, your Looker deployment, um, always happy to do a demo, always happy to speak to people. So again, you can, uh, through our website, you can find a way to do that. And uh, we'd be very happy to chat to you about anything we talked about today, as well as whether Spectacles might be able to help your Looker deployment. Uh, we've run longer than the 30 minutes. Appreciate you all all sticking with us for a, a full 42. Um, again, really great to have so many of you join today. Um, having you, the community here, is really why we do these webinars. Josh and I were members of the Looker community well before uh, we ran this company. We actually met through the Looker community. So it's great to have you here. Um, and I'll just echo what I said at the top. If there's topics you want to hear about, there's things you'd like to talk about, if you've got any feedback, um, please do get in touch. Um, we really do this for, for all of our mutual benefit. And so uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And so uh, that's it today. Big thank you from me and from Josh. Um, and we will hopefully see you all in two weeks. See you then.